everybody. It's good to see smiling faces as always. As we begin to worship the Lord, and let's just stand today.
Well, good morning to you all. Blessings. Uh, would you bow your heads and pray with me as we uh, continue this morning in worship and rejoice over this uh, this great day? So, Lord God, we just thank you so much for the, the joyous moment of, of baptism, Lord God, coming and the public declaration of faith, Lord God. And I, I'll never forget that day, Lord God. And help us now to publicly declare our love for you and our tithe and our offering as well, Lord God. And I just pray that you would bless it richly um, um, for, for the giver, Lord God, and for those that it blesses. In Jesus' name. Amen.
Brother Dean to come up. I see we're being optimistic again. Okay. Hey, welcome to River City Calvary Chapel. We're glad you're here. You glad to be here? Yeah. All right. Well, uh, think, please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. Things are a little crazy around our house. That's right. My, my beautiful baby dog, Daisy, has developed an ingrown tail. Which is really difficult now because we have to take her to get x-ray to find out whether she's happy or not. So, you can keep that up in prayer. Okay. We've got a wonderful time after church today. Uh, we have our baptism and barbecue. Yay! Yay. All right. So, um, we're using the church cafe to eat the barbecue and then the baptism's outside. And we've got a jump house that's just absolutely huge. Um, I think every time we get a different jump house, it'll get bigger and bigger. We can actually, we got a slide. Uh, Mike's, Mike's excited about the jump house because he's making gestures towards me. But um, 
anyway, the kids can uh, go in the slide, and there's a little bit of water involved, but don't be, don't be alarmed about that. Um, and then if you are going to get baptized, you want to see Pastor Mike uh, for that. If you want to get barbecued, please sauce yourself after the service. And if you'd like to be barbecued and baptized, uh, please use a wet nap before entering the pool. I'd like to thank our helpers this morning who helped set stuff up out there and over in the kitchen and just all those who serve the Lord through their ministries here. I want to give them a round of applause. Huh? Okay, and those of you who have pre-ordered Lumpia, you can, you can applause the fact that the Lumpia are ready. Um, and it'll be picked up in the cafe after the church service, so be sure to pick those up today if you've ordered them. And then this coming Saturday is our monthly homeless ministry. So remember, that's a wonderful opportunity that we have to show the face of Jesus uh, to those who normally are ignored. And uh, we're still looking for men's clothing donations in particular. So definitely desperate for men's clothes in particular. So if you can swing those by the church, uh, that would be wonderful. And then if you're going to help out with the, uh, the homeless ministry this coming Saturday, uh, please be at the church at 730 and we'll, we'll pull things together and pray and head out there and, um, and show Jesus' face to them. Um, college group with crew is coming up, uh, Campus Crusade for Christ. They'll, it'll begin um, September 3rd here in our church sanctuary. They're going to be meeting here at 7 o'clock on Wednesdays. So let's keep lifting that up in prayer. And then down the road, September 12th through 14, we have the Women's Retreat at Lakeland Village in uh, South Lake Tahoe. Um, and if you sign up and pay before August 12, and I believe August 12 is on only a couple of days, you save five bucks. All other payment is due no later than September 7th. So uh, please sign up for that. And why don't we go ahead and go to prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for the, uh, for the blessing that you are to us. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to worship you, Lord. And we can worship you here. We can worship you anywhere. But we thank you for giving us a place to do it here, uh, Lord, and servants to lead us in that here. And uh, Lord, uh, we just ask a, a blessing on the, um, the baptism and barbecue um, after the service today. Lord, we just um, ask that you would uh, do a wonderful work in those who are coming out publicly and testifying uh, for you uh, by being baptized, uh, Lord, uh, and that we as a church would be of support to them, that they would be growing to you with you um, on a daily basis, Lord, um, and that you would bless them for, uh, for uh, taking this action. And uh, we um, ask your blessing on our pastor as we um, seek to learn from your word today. We say and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, why don't you go ahead and greet each other, including folks that you might not know, and make sure that you let everybody see your tail wag. tried moving that thing. That thing is, uh, Brian and I had to roll that thing by ourselves once, and it's about 350 to 400 pounds, uninflated, and then you put water in it and slide down this thing. I can't wait to watch the kids. It's going to be a blast. So, you know, hey, kids, even if they didn't wear the, 
you know, if you didn't think about the swimsuits or whatever, hey, it's okay. Just let them go on down that thing, and we're going to have some fun. But the but the main reason is that we're going to just gather together again, as we do periodically, and and uh, obey the Lord. Give an opportunity to obey the Lord in baptism. Um, baptism is really, it's not something that saves you. It doesn't make you any more righteous in God's sight. Uh, the only thing that makes us righteous is what we've been talking about every week, right? The blood of Jesus, and, and it's by the grace of God that we are saved. And it's, and, and it's not by works, so that no man may boast. Uh, a lot of us were baptized uh, probably in uh, certain denominations or certain belief systems that perhaps when you were a child or when you were very, very young, you were baptized. But then now you've come to that place where you, you really have submitted your life to the Lord where you see that you hadn't before and you've given your life to the Lord and you've received him. And, and um, it's a great thing to just obey him in baptism because it's an outward sign. It's a testimony to the world that, that you love Jesus and, and you're not afraid to tell people. Um, and it's all full of symbols as we go under the water, right? It's, it's the, the symbol of Jesus' death. And, and also what, what Ephesians tells us that we've died with Christ. We've died, uh, uh, you know, that's the way God has, has purposed it, that in, in his eyes we have died to our own sin. A dead man cannot be put in jail for his tr crimes, right? He's dead. He can't try him. You can't judge him in that way. And punish him, he's already dead. And so as we have died in Christ, our sins have no effect over us in the sense of, of they've been forgiven and washed away once and for all. And then as we come up out of the water, some of, we, some of you guys, I sit on you and make you stay down there a little bit longer. And you're struggling. Let me out, let me out. No. Then when I bring you up, right, it, there's a great symbol again of what happened on the third day. When Jesus died, he was buried. And on the third day, what happened? He's living. He's arrived. He arose. And, and that beautiful washing of the water is also that, that beautiful testimony of how uh, the blood of Christ has washed us free. You get it? So there's a lot of sim symbology. And you know what's great? I, I, I was never one for rituals. I, I hated rituals. Um, empty rituals, you know, just things that you do and you feel like you're all holy and all this stuff, but they have nothing to do with the Bible. But this is one of the rituals of the Bible. Uh, we're told that we are to practice. It is a ritual. It is. It, it is a uh, something uh, that we do physically and we go through this kind of a rite if you, if, if R I T E, uh, to, to perform this thing. And it's very, very sacred to the Lord. I remember that, see, I didn't get baptized. I was a hard head in every way, but about three years or four years after, um, I knew the Lord and I'd been born again. I finally obeyed the Lord in baptism, but I'll never forget as much as I had grown in my spiritual walk before then, it was like a launching board when I obeyed in baptism. Um, I, at that time, I think I really, at that point, received the baptism of the Spirit. Not that those are two are necessarily connected, but that is when I really, re uh, about that time, I received the baptism of the Spirit. And it was just, I don't know, it was just something that happened that just launched me uh, further, much further, uh, in growing in the Lord by just obeying Him, you know? So maybe you didn't plan on being baptized today. Uh, or maybe you are planning, but you're kind of starting to chicken out a little bit or something like that. Hey, just get dunked. You know, let's have, uh, let's go for it. Let's just do what the Lord says. And, and you're welcome to be last minute -y. That's okay. Just come on up to me and say, hey, I want to, I believed in Jesus and I want to uh, be baptized by, by faith. And, and we'll just enjoy with you. And, and it's a wonderful time to be prayed over. And we, we ask this, the Holy Spirit to get, guide us in our prayers over you. And uh, we will be asking for the fullness of the Spirit in your life. So, um, great time to be prayed over. So I hope that, you, that many of you will um, take us up on that and, and um, be part of that. 
Hey, how many of you guys are from Galt? I need our Galt people to raise their hand. I know a lot of them are ushering right now. They're out of here. There's one, two, three, four. Okay, well, some of them are missing today. We love the Galt people. They're our country people. And we need the country people in this church, you know? Now, what you didn't know, we have a large Bible study out in, in Galt. Um, and one of the things you didn't know, it's Galt is very, very famous. Did you know that? It's, it's very famous for the smell when you go out there. No, I'm kidding. No, as you're driving out there, it's also famous for something else. And that, it, no, no, it's famous for its country western songs. Did you know that? They're a little bit offbeat. You know, that's the way Galt is. Let me name some of these titles. They're very colorful. They're very meaning, um, meaningful to our neighbors in uh, the South, the Galtites. Here's some of their favorites. While my John Deere was breaking your field, your dear John was breaking my heart. <laughs> Have you heard of that one? That's from Galt. Another one is, my wife ran off with my best friend, and I sure do miss him. <laughs> That's another famous one. There's kind of a blues kind of a thing that they got over there in Galt. It's this song, you done tore out my heart and stomped that sucker flat. <laughs> yeah, that's a Galt one. And, and um, uh, there's, this is the, the famous of Jan Cook. She just loves this song. It's been, it goes like this. It says, it's actually kind of a gospel thing. I've been roped and thrown by Jesus in the Holy Ghost corral. <laughs> and that's, yeah, yeah, give him a, huh? Old Galtites, you guys are awesome, man. So in this series, we, um, in this series, we're calling it God 101, right? And we've been talking about what every Christian needs to know, uh, the essentials of our, of our faith in Christ. And we've learned a lot of, of things. A lot of us knew these things, but perhaps it, it kind of maybe brought it more together in, in, in application in our life. And we've discovered, first of all, that God is uh, omnipresent, that he's everywhere, right? There's nowhere that God is not present. But remember, it doesn't mean that God is everything. He is everywhere, not everything. This stand is not God, okay? There are some belief systems that would say God is everything. No, he's not everything, but he is everywhere present, you see. And, and that God is omnipotent, that he has unlimited power. There's nothing that God cannot do within his will. And that he is omniscient. He knows everything. Even the minutia of the universe, every single detail, he knows it. And, and that's always comforting to me. I, I always think of it in this way. He knows every dirt, d dirty, dark secret that I could have. I hope I don't have any anymore. But everything I've ever failed in or I ever will fail in, because this knowledge transcends time. He knows the future, the end, everything. So he is omniscient. Also, we discovered that he's sovereign, that even though things seem crazy sometimes in our lives, that God is sovereign and is ruling and has a, a, a way of turning all things together for good if we love God and we're called according to his purpose. He's sovereign. He's a sovereign God. And then also we discovered that he is true. Uh, every, everything about him, his word is true, his knowledge, his, uh, everything, his standard is truth. His desire is for us not to go into some kind of a little phony belief system, not to believe in some kind of a fairy tale, but it's truth, it's accurate, it's factual, what he did. And our faith is based upon facts, not on empty beliefism. And also we discovered that God is holy, that he's righteous, and that he is good. He'll never make a false judgment, never make a false ruling, never do anything that is not righteous. And then also we've discovered that God is love. And um, uh, he's demonstrated that love and always points us to the cross when he says, this is how much I love you. And, and so he loves us, man. And so... We realize that God didn't stay in the safety of heaven. He didn't, uh, but he entered into our world, didn't he? 
God became flesh and, and he breathed our air and he shared our pain and, and he walked in our shoes and he faced the temptations that we have, but he, fa- but he faced them different than us. We fail. He didn't. And, and so he lived our life and he died our death and he rose from the dead and he is our high priest who understands and sympathizes sympathizes with us, right? And so we heard all about uh, why Jesus came, uh, much about that at least. And so now we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit. We're going to begin for the next, uh, for this week and next week to speak about the person of the Holy Spirit. You ever had uh, people, I, it seems like when we talk about the Holy Spirit, it's almost like uh, some people will refer to him as an it. Oh, I got the power, you know, as if it's an it. Or, or it's just power, or it's just this impersonal force or something. Jehovah's Witnesses believe that, by the way, that the Holy Spirit is merely just like electricity that, that can be turned off and on. It's not a person or anything like that. Well, and of course, they don't believe in the, in the Trinity, or that, and namely that the Holy Spirit is God, as the Bible says. And so we're going to be talking about this important doctrine. Um, God is a spirit. The Bible uh, tells us God is uh, a spirit. Now, when we say that he is God, first of all, I'm going to prove it to you. We're going to show some places. But we remember also that we've said that G- God the Son is Jesus, and he is God. Uh, in the, we talked about John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, with the Father, right? With God. But he, he also says, but the Word was God also. Very weird in one way how can you how can you be with god and then be god it almost sounds uh, like you know weird right it is it is pretty strange it's something that god can do that we have no inkling on how he does it it is a mystery but we understand it it's been revealed to us but there's a third person and that is the holy spirit who is also god and so Three distinct persons. You know the Shema that the, that the Jewish people uh, recite in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. It says, the Lord our God is what? One. One Lord, right? And, and one God. And, and indeed, we believe that. Uh, the, the, we don't contradict that. We worship one God, not multiple gods. The Bible does not um, uh, teach polytheism. Okay, and and that is not what we are. We're not polytheistic. We are monotheistic. There is only one God, and we worship one God. Not three gods, but one God. But in God's, you know, absolutely infinite capabilities, he has chosen to manifest himself in three distinct different persons. One, the Father. God is our Father. The other one, God is the, our Son, uh, the, the Son of God, rather. Jesus Christ, God in, in, in the flesh. And then God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And so um, I think that probably a couple of, I won't go through every proof text on this. What, how do you know that there's a Trinity? How do you know what, you know, the word Trinity is not in the Bible and people will argue that way. Of course, it's not in the Bible. It's a theological term for what we see. I mean, I wouldn't hate to have to, every time I want to refer to the Trinity, have to go through the whole teaching before you understood what I was talking about. I would rather just be able to say a term, you know, you know, the, the Trinity. Okay. Well, the, well, we understand that, uh, what that is. And, and so uh, it's interesting, as we're going to be baptizing today, we're going to do what Jesus said to do, and that is to baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity is right there in the baptismal formula uh, in, in the scriptures. Um, it's interesting that that uh, also when Jesus was, um, and let's go ahead and, and look uh, in our Bibles to John chapter 14, first of all, and then we'll be opening up to chapter 16 after that. But look at John 14 with me. Jesus said, I will pray uh, the Father, and he will give you, notice, another helper, Paracletus, that he may, now notice it's a he, it's not an it. He may abide with you forever. Who is he? 
the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But he will be with you and will be, notice, in you, in you. And I will not leave you orphans, Jesus says. I will come to you. He's going to come back to us. And so Jesus is promising to his disciples, just as he's about to leave, as he's about to go to the cross and die for the sins of the world, that, that uh, he's, he's telling them that, that, that I'm leaving you with the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, God, in, God the Spirit. And not only will he be with you in this world, but he will come uh, later on. He's going to talk about him coming upon us in power. But he also says that he will come into you. As a believer, all every disciple of Jesus Christ, something that happened that perhaps you had no inkling of when you believed the Lord. Perhaps you had a, a great sensation of some sort, a great emotion or even a physical um, uh, feeling uh, of it. Some people um, report that. Others don't. But the Holy Spirit, nonetheless, the moment that you believed in Jesus and trusted him, when you were born again, the Spirit of God came into you in a very physical way. Matter of fact, he says this about your physical body, that your body is the temple of what? The Holy Spirit. And so we have, we are not God, but God is living in us now as we have been born again. God, the Holy Spirit. And so he's very, very important to us because he's always pointing and testifying about Jesus. And he is the one that is uh, what well, we're going to see his ministry here in a second. I better just turn. Look over at John chapter 16. John chapter 16. Move a couple chapters over. Beginning in verse 7. Jesus speaks about this Holy Spirit. I tell you the truth. Verse 7, it is for your good that I'm going away. Jesus says, this is, this is really a, a, a good thing for you, for me to leave. You know, uh, Jesus was, was God in the flesh. He could only be certain places at certain times. But now God, the spirit, who has no physical presence, he is spirit, will come into every believer at once. And they will have the presence of God and the voice of God speaking to them and teaching them his ways. And also empowering him. And everybody can have that. And so he says, this is it's for your good that I go away. Unless I go away, notice the counselor will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, notice, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment, in regard to sin because men do not believe in me, in regard to righteousness because I'm going to the Father where you can see me no longer, and in regard to judgment because the prince of this world, speaking of Satan, now stands condemned. And so notice what that Jesus says when the Holy Spirit comes, when he has come, notice he will convict, verse 8, he will convict. Uh, uh, the Spirit is a him, it's not an it. He is a person, he is a personality, and he has a specific work that he wants to do in this world, and he has emotions, as we will find out. Uh, he, he is a, a person in every way. Now, I could say to this microphone, you stupid, ugly microphone, it's not going to worry about that. It doesn't. It could care less. As a matter of fact, it doesn't even know it. It's an it, right? It's a thing that we've created and we put together and everything. But if I insult the, the Holy Spirit, he cares and he feels it. Uh, a, a person has emotion and has feelings, okay? The Holy Spirit, notice in verse 8, one of his... Uh, of the reasons why he came is, is that he came to convict us of our sin. Look at verse 8. When he comes, he will convict, notice, the world of guilt in regard to sin. Notice it doesn't say that he's going to convict us of every sin. But he, he convicts us in regard to, to our sinfulness. 
And, and so uh, the Holy Spirit takes the message of the death and the resurrection of Jesus, and he convinces us of our need to turn to God. That's why it's so important as you pray for people that you love and people that need Jesus so much. You know, you, you pray, pray, Holy Spirit, show them their need. Show them their true spiritual condition. Show them where they're, where, that they fall short, that they need you, Lord, that they are sinners in need of, of forgiveness. Uh, and, and so, you know, we, we pray, God, Lord, convict them by your Holy Spirit. And, and, and he never drives us. His, his way is never to, to convict us in a way of condemning us or, or bring us to despair and depression. That's not the spirit of the Lord. But it is to bring us to conviction, not despair, but to conviction, to understand that we, that we need him and to send us into the open arms of Jesus who loves us and want, who has bought that forgiveness uh, for us. Uh, in fact, we read on the day of Pentecost that remember Simon Peter in the book of Acts, he got up to preach to these people who some, many of them were, were the people that, that screamed, crucify him to Jesus. And here he's risen from the dead. The baptism of the Holy Spirit had come upon the believers. They were speaking in other languages, and it was a miracle, a sign that God was with them. And it was just like, and they're saying, like, what is this all about? Peter gets up to preach to him. And it says that <clears throat> he starts to tell them that, hey, look, you're the one that caused the, the, the crucifixion of the Lord. He was crucified not only for you, but because of you. And in verse 37 of Acts 2, it says, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And, and they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what can we do? What shall we do, man? They were cut to the heart. It describes something sudden. That word is a sudden, unexpected stabbing in the heart. And it's, it's a word used to describe, it's a unique word in the New Testament, to describe the conviction of the Holy Spirit to them, that they had been wrong about Jesus, that they really needed to fall on their, their knees to the Lord uh, that had died for them. And, and so, you know, it's kind of a rough word to say that he cuts to the heart like a dagger or something like that. But let's kind of take it this way. What if it was a surgeon? You have a, a heart valve that needs repair and he takes out the scalpel, this sharp knife, and he, and he cuts you open under anesthesia, of course, and fixes what is wrong and gives you a new uh, lease on life, you know? Uh, he fixes what is wrong. May, may we just think of it in that term because it's always the conviction of the Holy Spirit is never to condemn, but to, to save, to heal, to make whole uh, people. And so the, the Holy Spirit has, has come to convict. And then look at verse 9 here. Let's read that together. In regard to sin, because men do not believe in me. Why does the Holy Spirit come and what is his purpose in the world? He's come to bring us to Christ, to bring us to him, showing us our need for Jesus Christ. Remember, I've shared my testimony. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but, but basically it, um, uh, it, was, it was quite amazing as I think about it because I really opened myself up to a lot of bad possibilities when I prayed. I didn't know who God was. I had no idea. I had heard all the theories. I'd heard a bunch of junk. I had been part of different Eastern meditation things and cults and different things. But I, had ne I really knew, I did not know who Jesus was. And I was ready to commit my life to the Lord. And I asked God, show me whoever you are. I don't know. And I'm really willing. And I started coming through the possibilities of that prayer. <laughs> and I started to say, Lord, Okay, if you're the God of the Jehovah's Witnesses, I'll, I'll do it. I don't care. I've got to know who you are. If you want me to go shave my hair and go sell flowers at the airport with a gown on and yell Hare Krishna and have a, you know, whatever, I'll do that. I really will. I'll do anything you want. I've got to have you, God. I was convicted to the bone. My heart was stabbed and pierced. And I needed God, and I prayed to him very, very openly and honestly. And he was so, so wonderful to me because the Holy Spirit came to me and showed me who God really was. And he came and showed me the truth. 
And so it was a wonderful thing. He showed me Jesus, man. And, and so uh, look at verse 13. It says, but when he, the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. That's interesting about the Holy Spirit. He's not telling you, oh, come unto me, come unto me. He's always submitting to God the Son. Remember what Jesus was always talking about. Jesus was always talking about his father in heaven. Oh my, I don't, these words aren't mine. They're the father's, you know, give all glory to the father. He always did that. And that perfect submission within the Trinity as the son submitted to the father and the spirit submits to the son. And yet they're all equally God. And, and, and so it says when he, the spirit of truth comes, he'll guide you into all the truth he will not speak on his own. He'll speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. And so uh, the third purpose of, of the Holy Spirit in the world and why he has come is to show me my need for righteousness, to show us, show me that I, I need a, a righteousness that's not of my own, uh, you know, to convict me of, my, uh, of, that, of that need for God in my life to forgive me. John 16, 10 says, in regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, notice, where you can see me no longer. You see, Jesus did a, quite a good job in convicting people of their need for righteousness, didn't they? What did he say about the old uh, Pharisees? He says, man, you know, he says, hey, uh, have you ever looked lustfully upon a woman? You Pharisees who say you live by the law and you've fulfilled all the law, you ever looked lustfully upon a woman? Just give her a second look and say, "Woo, look at her in that gown or whatever they wore back then, that robe. Oh, well, oh, or have you ever gotten angry and called somebody stupid? Well, sure, they had all done that. He says, you know what, when you do that, God is so holy that that even you just calling somebody stupid is like the sin of murder. Far out. They got convicted off of that. Jesus was the one that used to convict these guys. He even said, hey, unless your righteousness surpasses these um, right, righteous looking guys, these real religious dudes called the Pharisees, it, it, unless your righteousness is far, superior, is far superior to theirs, you can't see God. You can't go to heaven. And so he says, you know what? I'm sending the Holy Spirit because I'm not going to be here anymore to tell you these things. And the Holy Spirit is that one that needs to convict us of a need for righteousness. Guys, he's so important to us. Now I want to talk, because remember we've talked about, uh, again, he uh, is that one who has emotion that reacts to the things that we say and we think, and he is part of our life. He is God in every way. Those faculties are there. He is a person in every way. I want to talk about, and I don't know if you know about this, but there are six different sins that are that against the Holy Spirit. Six sins against the Holy Spirit. Some of them only uh, that, that believers are the ones that can commit. Others only unbelievers can commit against the Holy Spirit. Six sins. I want to talk to you about those. Because when we think about that the Holy Spirit is in our hearts, He's in our, I mean, in our bodies, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit that remember, we always talk about the fruit of the Holy Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, all these beautiful things that that is a fruit of him being in our life and being able to change us and mold us and shape us and affect us in our life. Guys, that's pretty important, isn't it? And so I don't want to um, ignorantly or any other way, be sinning against the one who brings all that good stuff in my life. I want to be in harmony with him. I want more of the Holy Spirit in me. Do you understand? More of him. Now, some of us have probably been wounded along the way with a bad witness about the Holy Spirit. I remember that uh, just as I got saved, I, I matter of fact, it was probably just days after I, I uh, somebody... Um, uh, a man that I really liked, Hal Lindsey, was going to be at a major Pentecostal church here in town. And they were in the habit of, during the service, everybody speaking in tongues, so to, they thought, or they, they assumed it was speaking in tongues, that they were exercising the gift of tongues in the main service. And here I came in, I don't know if I was all the way saved or if I was just 
just brand new, but it freaked me out. Everybody was just like the, like a bunch of crazy people. Exactly what Paul says will happen if we are all speaking in tongues, if, we, if you have the gift of tongues, and speaking in tongues with no interpretation of it. He says, aren't unbelievers or people who don't know the Lord going to come in there and say, you're a bunch of wackos? Paul admits that, and he says, don't do that. Don't do that. And so I was in a place where it was Pentecostal seizures were going on, you know, and I'm in here and thinking, man, this feels weird. This is weird, you know. And uh, so I, it kind of wounded me, and I had a couple people lay a couple trips on me about the Holy Spirit and that, first of all, you must speak in tongues or you're not really filled with the Holy Spirit. These things that are not true, okay, and I'm not going to get into the teaching today about all that stuff. But, but uh, also the feeling, because people would say, well, I just can't help it. The Holy Spirit came over me, and I started standing up and doing these weird things, you know, in church and all that stuff. And that kind of freaked me out. And I'm over here, I don't know if I really want the, much of the Holy Spirit. I mean, I know I got him, I, uh, but just stay over there, you know. I don't know if I want it. Some of us can relate to that, right? And inside of us, almost a little bit of a fear about saying, Holy Spirit, Fill me, use me, fill me up, Lord. Give me more, more and more of your presence in my life. But I want to assure you this, that th those things are not true. And the Holy Spirit is a perfect gentleman. He doesn't force himself upon anybody, nor would he cause you to do anything outside of the word of God. Uh, he is God, and, uh, and you can trust him. So, but there are six sins, okay? Let's look at the first one. I want you to turn over to Acts chapter 5. Verse 1, Acts chapter 5. The sin that is mentioned here against the Holy Spirit is, and this was by evidently believers, but it was a sin against the Holy Spirit, is the sin of lying. Of lying. There were two people, it's, it's, and thank God this is not I mean, I'm going to thank God that he doesn't do this now, uh, that this is not one of the miracles that he operates in right now of slaying people in the church because they lied to the Holy Spirit. Thank God. A lot of us would not be here right now, right? But here is an example. A man named Ananias together with his wife Sapphira. They also sold a piece of property, and with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. And then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit, notice, and have kept for yourself some of the money you received for the land? Didn't it belong to you before it was sold? And after it was sold, wasn't the money at your disposal? What made you think uh, of doing such a great thing? You have not lied to men, notice, but you have lied to God. Look what it says here. First of all, the Holy Spirit was lied to. And then the last verse, you have not lied. When you lied to the Holy Spirit, you didn't lie to men. You lied to God because the Holy Spirit is God, you see. And so this lying of the Holy Spirit, now what does it mean? What were they doing? They wanted to be big shots. They wanted to be uh, show off their so-called spirituality. And they're going and making an offering before everybody's eyes. Man, of course, that's wrong right there, right, that we would do that. Jesus says, you know, keep all those kind of things like how you pray and how you give and all that stuff. Keep it so your right hand doesn't know what your left hand does. If your father knows what you do in secret, and he'll reward you. You don't have to do it for the eyes of men. But they came anyway, and they said, hey, we sold our property, and here's all the money. We got a whole bunch of money for it, and here's all the money. We're giving it to the Lord. We're so cool. We're so spiritual. But what they had done was kept back some of the money and only gave a par portion of it. Now, there was, the sin was not in that. The sin, they didn't have to give all the money. That was not the command of the Lord. But when they portrayed themselves as giving all of it to the Lord in worship, and they were lying about it, guess what they were? They were lying to the Holy Spirit. They were hypocrites. They were wearing a mask. You remember wearing a mask in, I don't know, I used to do it in Halloween. I'd always be the same thing every time, though. Usually a tramp was what I was. 
because I always had old ho- pants with holes in it. Back then, that wasn't cool. That was for Halloween when you had all the pants ripped out. Now they wear it to church. But that, was, uh, but that wasn't cool back then. And you get the charcoal and all that stuff. But every once in a while, I would get one of those, you know, masks like, I don't know, maybe it was Batman or something like that. And you put it on. And, you know, those silly things, they never fit your face right. And you're breathing and the, and the hot air of your nose is hitting back in your eyes. And, and you start sweating. And, and you can't really see through those little slits anyway. Well, anyway, I digress. <laughs> Wearing a mask. You know, garden variety sinners, you know, praise God for garden variety sinners, right? They cuss it up. They get drunk. They don't care who sees it. They, they'll tell you off. They'll be whatever they are. And hey, that's the way it is. You know, I, I, that's who I am. But there are those that, that would wear a mask and they would come and appear righteous or a mask of righteousness, you see. In church, sing the songs, go through the lingo at church, have fellowship, and then go live a life. Go live a life that is, that is uh, just as sinful in any, every other way. Just live a life that you, it, it, the rest of the week that no one would even identify you as a Christian. Guys, who do you think is, is farther off from being right with God or, 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 or even the hope of even being saved? I believe it's a garden variety sinner. I believe that we should just be who we are, man. If, if that's where you're at and that's who you are, man, be who you are. Don't be a phony. Because God knows anyway. And you have more hope for you of just sitting there and being convicted by the Holy Spirit rather than being somebody that goes to church and is so phony and such a hypocrite. And you hear the message over and 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 over and, over and, over and it never pierces that hardened heart of yours. God says, you know, we, we're, we're responsible for what we hear and what we know. We'll, we'll have a harder judgment because of what we know and we don't act upon. And there is a hardening effect that can come as we sit in, in a church and just lie to the Holy Spirit, man. Just lie. We can lie about things that the Holy Spirit is convicting us about in our life. And he's saying to us, hey, you know what? Quit justifying what you're doing, Christian. I know you got it all figured out and you think you know why you can get away with why you're the exception to what the word says and what God tells you to do. He says, quit lying to me. It's a sin against the Holy Spirit to do that. And, and you know, I think the most heavyweight hypocrite that we can find in the Bible has got to be Judas Iscariot. Think about that. Judas Iscariot in the Bible. He has appeared to be a stand-up guy, didn't he? Especially when that woman, remember that woman that broke the alabaster um, uh, sacrificial, give that perfume, and she anointed the feet of Jesus, and he whirled around. It was worth a lot of money. And, and it says that Judas stood up indignantly, and he says, hey, couldn't this have been sold for the money, for money? And we could have been giving this out to the poor to feed the poor, man, feed the homeless, dude. What's this, done? you know, putting it all over Jesus' feet? Later on, the disciples, uh, you know, maybe they had thought, man, that, boy, he's, on, he's right. We're, wow, that's, he's holy, man. He always wants to just do the right thing. You know, after all, God wants to feed the homeless and wants to feed uh, the poor and all this stuff. But we're told by the writer of, of, I think it's in Luke, it says Judas did this not because he cared for the poor, but because he was in charge of the money and he would steal it. And that's heavy hypocrisy to live in that kind of a reality in your life around Jesus, to live in that kind of reality in your life in the church where, where the word is being preached and taught, man, that takes, that really does it. But, but that wasn't even the worst. You know, you think about when he actually, um, turned Jesus over to the authorities when he betrayed him, what did he betray him with a kiss? I mean, he could have said, hey, I'll point them out to you. He could have went over and said, oh, hey, I'll put my hand on him. And that's the guy, you know. They didn't know, weren't sure of who he was because Jesus was such an ordinary looking guy, I believe. 
But he kissed him. And not only did he kiss him, it says in, in the original language that it was multiple kisses. Man, that is the ultimate hypocrisy guy. The multiple, multiple, it, it is just amazing. But through that, he must have appeared still in his appearance to be, oh, so virtuous, you know, oh, but he was really very sinful and he was lying to, to the Holy Spirit. Oh, guys, number two, another sin you can commit against the Holy Spirit is grieving him, grieving the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4 on this, verse 29 says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may be uh, beneficial to those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God uh, uh, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, notice, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind to each other and compassionate with one another, forgiving one another just as in Christ God forgave you. Hey, guys, the word grieve here means to make, make the Holy Spirit sad, to bum him out, to make him sorrowful. And, and, and what makes, it, makes the spirit sad, what, what grieves him, according to this, a foul mouth, abusive language. And that doesn't mean you have to use four-letter words, but those are definitely included. But just, just using your mouth for evil things, using your language, because it says what, from what proceeds from the mouth, that comes from the heart. That is just revealing what's in the person's heart. And so profanity and dirty stories and vulgarity and all of that stuff. Uh, notice in verse 31, part of this is bitterness. Letting bitterness come out of, a, of our lives. That bums the Holy Spirit out. That brings grief to him. When we refuse to be reconciled, we refuse to, to forgive somebody. Well, I don't want to forgive him. Well, I just can't forgive him, or I'm not willing to forgive him. You don't know how bad it hurts. Well, how bad did it hurt Jesus to forgive you? How bad did it hurt Jesus to go to the cross for your sins? Instead, when we don't forgive and we're bitter, what do we do? We, we hang on to that person. We're thinking about them all the time. Matter of fact, we're punishing ourselves in that regard. We're replaying it over and over and over, what we would say to them, how we would tell them off. Right? Are you like me? When I do this, oh, man, I'm just thinking, oh, oh, man, I wish this happened to him. I wish this happened to him. Oh, this happened to him. And I'd say this, and I'd say this, and replaying it over and over. I'm the, 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 the victim. <sighs> I, I find also that sometimes a bitter person, one that is critical in their spirit, one who's always pointing out the flaws of other, others, oftentimes are hiding what is really their problems that are in their life. Look what it says about fits of rage and uncontrolled anger. Those things also, verse 31, bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling, and slander, along with malice. All those things bum the Holy Spirit out. Rage speaks of a person who is easily angered. I mean, that hot temper who raises their voice, starts shouting, starts yelling things at people. You know, short fuse, that kind of a thing. Slander speaks of saying uh, things that are intended, uh, evil things about others that has the element of untruth, actually. Gossip is saying things about other people, and that's another one of those areas that would grieve the Holy Spirit. But, but, but gossip is saying something, basically, I like to think of it this way, saying something about someone that if they were there in front of you, you wouldn't say it. You would not say it, but you're saying it behind their back to somebody else. Sharing, oh, just so you can pray. <laughs> Malice speaks of evil will, plotting or evil against somebody. <laughs> Number three, the, another th a sin uh, against the Holy Spirit is called quenching the Spirit. Quenching the Holy Spirit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5.19. Well, just you, you don't even have to look there. It's a really short one. Do not quench 
the spirit. Do not quench. Now, when you, we go camping, lately we haven't been able to have fires in our rings at camping because of all of the dry conditions, but normally, right? If you go camping and you have a nice fire, you know, that night, um, usually, you know, if you're going to, uh, you might just leave it burning at night, go, to, go sleep in the tent or whatever. I never go in a tent. Must have air conditioning in my camper. No, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not. Anyway, but the, when you're going to leave the campsite, if it's just kind of still smoldering and everything, what do you do? You go dr dump water on it and you quench the fire. You put it out. And so he's saying this is a sin against the spirit. Don't put out the Holy Spirit. Don't put out that fire uh, of the Holy Spirit. For instance, maybe the Holy Spirit is telling you to do a certain thing. I did this way back when. I, one of my greatest examples of how foolish I was was not witnessing to this fellow who was, I was a jazz musician back then. He came to do some sub work for me. And uh, he was playing piano, and I mean the Holy Spirit spoke to me in, in, in very, very strong terms and said to me, he is one of, he is mine, he is one of mine, I want you to tell him about me. And I'm thinking, what do you mean, he's saved? I didn't know enough theology to know that God can, God also chooses people, and, and that he's telling me, hey, this, uh, he needs to believe, but he is one of mine, he's one I've chosen. Speak to him, preach the gospel. And I, and I was, you know, I was just kind of a little bit prideful about it and I didn't want to do it. It was embarrassing or whatever. And so then the night was over with and everything. And uh, he went on the road for a whole month. And then uh, the Holy Spirit, the whole time is on me. I want you to speak to him about me. He's one of mine. He's one of mine. I even told other people that I knew that were Christians, man, this guy, uh, I've, the Lord has been telling me he's his. And they're saying, no, he does coke. He does all this. You know, this guy's out there, man. You know, he's not, he couldn't be a Christian, you know, because that's how we were taking it. 30 days later, he was back in town off the road, and I, I, I had to do it. I was just aching to do it after that from all the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I called him, and I said, hey, hey, how you doing, Charlie? And he says, oh, I'm doing great. I said, well, how are you doing spiritually? And he says, man, I'm really searching. And he, I said, I'd like to come over to you and talk to you about the Lord. He says, I wish you would. And it was an open door, and I came over there. Within 20 minutes, he was crying on my shoulder to receive the Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit was coming into his life. That was Charlie Peacock, a famous producer, music producer in the Christian realm. But, but it, you know, I was grieving the Holy Spirit. He was telling me to do something and I didn't do it. And, and, and so it's a grief. I'm putting out, or I'm sorry, I'm, I'm quenching the Holy Spirit. Excuse me. I'm quenching the Holy Spirit. And so, guys, what are those things that the Holy Spirit's telling you, that's prompting you to do? If you don't do it, you're quenching him. And that's not a good thing because when we quench him, there's less fruit also. All, all of his presence is hampered in our life. And we must not quench the Holy Spirit. He wants to do something through you and in you. But remember what the scripture says, for we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works which he prepared in advance for us to do. So we're on a mission field. We got a job. And the Holy Spirit is prompting us to, to the different jobs that we need to do every day, whatever it may be. And he's speaking to us, do not quench him. I believe that if this church was not, uh, if, if we were all not quenching the, spirits as, the Spirit as individuals, there would be much greater things that we would see. We would be hearing of miracles every day in, the, in our fellowship. Oh man, you wouldn't believe what happened is I just you know, obeyed the Lord and walked through this door. And, oh man, this guy got saved and this happened and this happened. It's amazing what we would see as we walk and allow the Lord to use us and don't quench. Don't put out the fire of what the Lord is, uh, is showing you. Look, another one, a number four on the list is resisting the spirit, resisting the spirit. And I believe that these are sins that an, a non-believer can commit. A non-believer commits a resisting of the Holy Spirit. Acts 7.51, it says, When Stephen was stood in, uh, before the Sanhedrin, he said in Acts 7.51, he says, You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You're just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. And God says in Genesis, he says, My spirit will not always strive with man. 
You know, as we hear the gospel, as these men did, and they were resisting the Holy Spirit, he's saying, man, you, you got hard hearts. And, and understand this, the Spirit will get, is giving you time right now. Today is the day of salvation, but it may not be for much longer. You have, some of us, I believe, I really believe this. You know that you need the Lord. You know that, that what the, the Bible is saying is true. You know you need Jesus in your life, but you're saying, no, nah, I'll do it another day. I'll do it another day. I, just not today. I'm not ready right now. And what you're saying by I'm not ready right now is I've got some more evil to do. I've got some more flesh feeding that I got to do. I got some more things that I want to do that displeases God. And, and the thing is, guys, that, that is what he's talking about here. Uh, the, this stiff nakedness, this, this resisting of the Holy Spirit. We do not have, and this is the truth, we do not have a guarantee for another hour, we don't have another minute, another second. We have all learned that in this body, if you've been here for this last couple of years, how many people pass away and how quickly uh, death can come at your doorstep. Are you prepared for that? If it was to happen today, stop resisting the Holy Spirit. And then lastly, look, or this is at number five, not last. Insulting the Holy Spirit where is listed in Hebrews chapter 10, 29. Insulting the Holy Spirit. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant? that sanctified him and who has insulted, notice the spirit of grace, insulting the Holy Spirit. I believe again, this is an unbeliever that can do this where he hears the truth of the gospel. The Holy Spirit is there in conviction. He knows it's the truth and then he just blows it off and says, ah, I'm not into that crap. And he, and he just says that, you know, the worst, most foul things about uh, the blood of Christ and the sanctity and the beauty of the love of the Lord for him. Ah, I'm not, you know, I believe that that is this sin that is, that is worse than resisting the Holy Spirit. Now he's insulting the Holy Spirit. And guys, the last list on here I want to give to you is the, is even the greatest sin. I, I was thinking, what do you think in your estimation is the worst sin ever? than anyone that could ever commit. I mean, I think that instantly we go towards rape or we go through child molestation or we go through mur to murder or manslaughter or just, you know what I mean, horrible things like that or these rich guys that rip off billions of dollars or we think about, oh, these, that's the worst kind of sin ever, but there is another sin. It's called the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. It is an unforgivable sin. The blood of Jesus did not atone for this one sin. There is no forgiveness for this sin. Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That's a heavy thing, isn't it? Blaspheme of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 12, 31. He says, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men. But the blaspheme against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Now, when I first heard that as a believer, I'm over here. I got to find, find out whether I've committed that baby because I don't want, I'm afraid, right? And that's the first thing you think because you think of blasphemy as being something you would say, you know, did I ever, I don't remember ever saying anything, you know, nasty to the Holy Spirit or bad, you know, or calling him a name or something. I don't remember doing that, but maybe I did, you know, back in my day, drug days or something, you know, maybe I'm not forgiven. But after a study in the word, I realized what he was talking about here. And that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is that final rejection of Jesus Christ. That the, remember what the Holy Spirit's trying to do? Convict you of your need for God. Convict you of your need for Christ to bring you to Jesus and to save you. It's that final hardening that can happen in a person's life. And it can happen while they're still alive, but off, or it can be, you know, just in that point, you know, where you're at, you're at death and you die without Jesus, you've just completely rejected him. And there is a blaspheme of the Holy Spirit that even if you wanted to, even if you wouldn't want to, is the fact, but even if you wanted to repent to Jesus, there is no forgiveness. Guys, that's the only sin that is unforgivable is that you die without Jesus Christ in your life. 
Well, that sounds bad. That sounds terrible. Well, who's to say I'm, uh, he's the only way? Well, come on. Are we going to go back to that? You can't know Jesus. You can't believe in Jesus unless you believe in what he said. And he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me, not through Buddha, not through anybody else. That's what Jesus said. And so, you know, don't, don't blame me. Don't blame this church. Don't blame other Christians. Blame the Savior. But that's what he said. But everybody wants Jesus on their own terms, you know, and we want to reduce him into our little form factor and put him in our pocket, and he's our little buddy. He's our good luck charm that we can pull out. Well, I believe, yeah, I believe Jesus. I, I was baptized. I, I, I went to a church. I raised my hand. I, oh, I pray. And we put that in our, in our, you see what God is looking at? He's looking at, he is truth. He's looking at your heart in truth. He's examining you according to truth. And so guys, let us be people in this church as believers who seek not to offend the Holy Spirit in any way that we don't quench him, that we don't grieve him, that we don't insult him, that we don't, you know, uh, harden ourselves against him, but that, we're, we, that, that we look to him and ask him to fill us and, 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 to, and uh, you know, use us and to be uh, encouraged about being filled with the Holy Spirit. But some of us here are, would say, and I, I certainly did, well, gee, I blew that, I've done that. Matter of fact, I can see where I did that not too long ago. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean I don't have the Holy Spirit? No. Does that mean, well, I've done it, and so that's it? <laughs> you know, that's, I've kind of written it, in, you know, in, in the stone or something? No. It says, notice, if we will confess our sins, 1 John, is speaking to believers, guys. If you will confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He's speaking about this very uh, thing. If we will confess, agree with the Holy Spirit about what we've done wrong. Agree to, to what, what he is saying to us and turn that over to him. He's faithful and just to forgive us and wash us clean. And so it's a beautiful thing we have in confession as believers. But what about those who yet not yet received? I, I fear for you in the sense that you might be here today and saying, I, I, I know it's true. I, I've seen the test. I, I can see in this person that I know that man, it's for real. And I know I need them, but you know what, man? I, I got some other things to do. I got some other plans. You're resisting the Holy Spirit. And it's a slippery slope to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And I hope that today that you would, no matter what, if you, you don't have all the facts yet, you know, or you don't have enough to yet really make a choice about Jesus, I, hey, praise God, come back. We'll, we'll keep working on that. That's a good thing. Keep on seeking. And the Lord will, will, will fill you in. It took me a while, too. But if you're in that place where you, you know what, you know what's going on. You know what's going on. The Holy Spirit's been showing you that, you see. Then please respond to him. Give your heart and your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him just fill you with his love and his presence in your life. Let him change your life, man, for good, for good things. And experience the Holy Spirit in your, in your person, in your life, in a personal way, as God speaks and uses you and does wonderful things in your life. Does that sound like a plan? Let's go ahead and bow our heads and close our eyes and pray unto the Lord. Thank you, Father, for loving us the way you do. Thank you, Father, for caring for us the way you do. Holy Spirit, we thank you for, first of all, Lord, awakening us to our need for you, for awakening us to our sin, Lord, and, our, and, and, and having a conscience about, wow, I did wrong. This is not the way I want my life to be, and this, this is unpleasing to God. And Holy Spirit, thank you for today of, again, showing us Jesus and pointing him out to us so that we might receive the forgiveness of God. And so while heads are bowed and eyes are closed today, is there some here that might just, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to make you join anything. I'm not going to point you out. But it's between you and the Lord right now as we pray. I'd love to pray with you to receive Jesus Christ today, 
to not resist the Holy Spirit anymore, to, to, to not insult the Spirit of grace, but to say, you know what, I know enough. I don't know everything, but I know enough to ask God for his forgiveness and ask Jesus Christ into my life today. If that's your prayer, would you raise your hand with me and just raise your hand and let me see it so I can pray along with you. Thank you back there. Is there anybody else? Lord, just speak to people right here. Would you like to? Okay. Anyone else that would like to just say, I want Jesus in my life. I want him to forgive me. I'm not afraid to say that. Raise your hand here. Yeah, thank you there, sir. Thank you. Anybody else that would just take a, take me up on that? Well, Thank you over there. Thank you there. Well, Father God, I thank you and praise you for your love for us. Lord, you're so good. And Lord, thank you for sending your son for a purpose, to be one of us, to live our life, to breathe our air, to walk this planet, to experience the temptation that we go through and to show us the way of life. We thank you, Lord, for going the full measure that you would humble yourself on the cross and die for our sins. And well, Lord, right now, Jesus, we thank you that you rose from the dead and that you are available right now and alive and you're willing to come into our hearts even now and to send your Holy Spirit into our lives. Oh, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Come into my life. I give you my heart, my life. I, I give you the reins over. I don't want to walk without you. And I ask you to make yourself more and more known to me. And Holy Spirit, would you have your way and your will in my life? In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Hey, stand up. Let's sing a song together.
Bless you for coming. Hey, remember this. As you go out and you go into the coffee shop, you can have some coffee or whatever. But uh, right outside that door, we're going to have free hamburgers and hot dogs all barbecued up for you. First thing we're going to do, though, however, is if you gather around, get yourself some uh, refreshments. We're going to have a baptism very quickly. Uh, and then we're going to eat. So we're going to do baptism first, then eat. And so if you'd like to come out there, kids are welcome to get on the jumper and everything. But if you today would like to be baptized, would you please come to come up here so that I can explain to you a little bit, make sure you understand how we're going to do that. And then we're going to, <coughs> excuse me, gather out there, okay? God bless. Have a great, great week. If you'd like prayer, you can come forward also. God bless you.